So our last speaker of today is Michael Schatz from the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory of Quantitative Biology. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, the uh, forays into the use of high-performance computing for sequence analysis. You heard Eddie talk about this it's a, uh, earlier today in the strategic planning session. This is really going to be critically important as the data sets get larger and larger and larger. So uh, uh, we we'll look forward to Michael's talk. So I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and, and thank all of you for, for participating today. So I'm going to be talking about something that I call the error of megagenomics. And I'm going to sort of operationally define this as very, very large scale biotechnology in combination with very, very large scale computational technology in support of biological questions. Now, when I saw that I was going to present almost immediately after Adam, I decided to, to downplay some of the computational technology because we just heard this excellent presentation about, about KBase and really focus primarily on the biotechnology as, a, as an enabler of, of really interesting biology and biological questions. So as a result, my outline is quickly kind of review the state of the art in biotechnology and then talk about a few different applications. The, the first of which, this cloud scale genomics for bioenergy is, is my placeholder for all of KBase. So we can think of, of Adam's talk totally embedded inside of mine. And then we're talking about some single molecule sequencing uh, and assembly questions and then talking about de novo mutations associated with autism spectrum disorder. So just to, I'm sure everyone's seen this slide or variants of this slide uh, over, the, over, the, over, the, over, the, over this conference and other conferences, but it's, it's quite remarkable to, to just reflect on the past 30 years to see sequencing go from the stone ages, where it's done primarily by hand, uh, into the first automated instruments, into the second automated instruments, with literally uh, orders of magnitude improvements to the, to the capabilities uh, of those instruments. When we, when we pause today and we look at, at the current state of the art of technologies, you know, we see that, that large scale sequencing is available today, cheaply affordable. Uh, today, the, the, the leading instrument in terms of throughput is, is probably the uh, uh, HiSeq 2000, uh, spec'd out to be about 60 gigabases per day uh, per instrument. At Cold Spring Harbor, we have about nine of these. So that means every single day is, is, uh, is approach, approaching a terabyte of data coming in. We look to the future just, just a little bit. We see that there are new instruments on the horizon. So there's actually an upgrade to the, to the Illumina instrument on the horizon, the, the, the HiSeq 2500. They're promising more than 100 gigabases of sequence per day. There's the Ion Proton uh, just a few months away using a totally different type of chemistry that is promising hundreds of gigabases per day. And then with the recent announcement of Oxford Nanopore, it's, it's you know, still an open question how it's going to deliver. But, but from the specs that have been revealed, you know, we're talking about many, many gigabases per day on his devices as little as a thumb drive. This is going to pretty dramatically uh, change the landscape of sequencing. So furthermore, if, if, if you, there's this really nice website that, that tracks the locations of all the next-gen sequencing instruments around the world. And it's just remarkable to see that you know, back in you know, the early days, sequencing was, was primarily done at sequencing centers. Like, and, and, it, and it continues to do excellent centers like JGI. Uh, you look at the map, you know, the usual suspects pop up, the Broad, the Sanger and so and uh, BGI and so forth. But what's remar remarkable to me is that is, is all these little flags in remote areas of the world where instruments are starting to be deployed. And then once the once the instruments become desktop, become thumb you know thumb drives. What I what I imagine is seeing this map in a few years. There's just going to be these little flags everywhere, everywhere. So this is this is when we're truly going to be in this era of of, of so-called megagenomics, where we'll be able to study populations around the world ask really deep questions about the dynamics of, of different systems. So today, the collective, if you take all these instruments on this map and you multiply them times their specs, there's the worldwide sequencing capacity is something like 15 petabases of sequence per year. So for those of you who are not familiar with this, it's kilobase, megabase, gigabase, terabase, petabase. So this is an enormous amount of data that's coming in that's going to require uh, enormous computational systems to store, to analyze, to compute. You know, all the, all the great things we just heard about, about K-base, I think is the DOE's visions for, t for standing up in front of this 15 petabases per year. The really scary thing about this number is that, you know, this is just a snapshot in time. It's the, the rate of increase is something like 5x per year. So 15 this year, you know, 60 petabases a year from now, hundreds of petabases in, in the not too distant future. This, this is what keeps me up at night is how the heck are we going to stand up in front of this avalanche of data. So if you, if you do just a Google search, DNA sequencing, there's a, you know, any number of large-scale megagenomics projects going underway. Here are just the logos from the top five that I happen to pick. So 
We have Thousand Genomes Project looking at uh, variations across thousands of people around the world. The Cancer, Gen the, uh, ca cancer Genome Atlas Project using deep sequencing to study uh, mutations and variations associated with, with multiple types of cancer. Genome 10K project, looking at uh, assembling, de novo assembling 10,000 vertebrate species. So uh, there is a risk of you know, yet another uh, genome syndrome coming up here. But really the, the, really the goal of this is to, is to build a really deep phylogenetic tree so that if you want to do comparative genetics at sort of any evolutionary distance, you can dial in any time frame that you may be interested in. So instead of do, looking at you know, thousands of samples of E. coli, looking at the pan genome of 50,000 genes, we can do that sort of deep analysis across the tree of life. This is, this is really cool and exciting to me. Uh, there's ENCODE that's using very deep sequencing to map out all the regulatory functional elements in, in the human genome and then a few, model, organis a few uh, uh, model organisms. And then Human Microbiome Project using very deep sequencing to characterize all the microbes and bugs that live on us and inside of us. Uh, the most sort of compelling uh, 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 example of why microbes might be interesting for human health is there was this really interesting study with, with mice models where they had skinny mice and obese mice and they swapped the, stu the stomach contents and then suddenly the skinny mice got obese and the obese mice got skinny. These are all these, all these projects and all the fantastic projects we heard about today and we'll hear about tomorrow are, are really being driven by improvements by, by biotechnology and also compute technology. Now, of course, the limitation is, is the information that comes off the, the biotechnology, off the sequencing instruments or the imaging instruments, doesn't actually answer any of these questions in themselves. Right? All, they, all they provide is this tiny, tiny little snapshot into a genome or into a system. They say nothing about the dynamics. They say nothing about the complete genome sequence. They say nothing about the regulatory uh, data on their own. What it requires is to turn those little tiny s segments, those little tiny sensor data into, into you know, biological results is computational work, is computer algorithms. So here are a few of the most, what I think are some of the most important algorithms for driving all of this. So number one that I'm going to be describing today, de novo assembly. So this is this process of taking short sequencing reads, and very much like you would reconstruct a puzzle from these short reads, we can do this with the short DNA fragments. The next one will be using, uh, 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 once we have a reference genome and, and we're looking at a new sample, uh, what we can do is, is use that reference genome to, to, to anchor the search for variation. So here I have a single nucleotide polymorphism uh, revealed through a stack of reads that have been aligned to the reference genome, but this could also be indels, copy number variations, structural variations, and so forth. The next box I have here I'm, I'm going to broadly characterize as differential analysis. So you can think of this as doing an RNA-seq or a chip-seq or a DNA-seq or a high seq a uh, type experiment under one, condition number one, and then a condition number two, and then seeing that different genes and exons are, are active uh, under different environmental or stress conditions. And then finally, if we kind of think about all these individual assays, we can start to build up. Uh, we can look at the phylogeny evolution, and then also the modeling of the dynamics of, of all of these various systems. So we kind of have the most basic baseline analysis, building up through populations, building up over time courses, to really draw some nice uh, biological conclusions. So again, this is all going to be driven through large-scale computational technology. This is where I drop in Adam's talk. But I'm going to jump to segment number two and talk just for a few minutes about de novo genome assembly. So genome assembly has been uh, uh, pretty widely accessible since the 90s. Uh, we heard from Carl you know, a lot of the early successes there. And it continues to have a lot of uh, successes. Although I'd still argue that it's still quite technically challenging to assemble, especially large genomes, uh, which makes it an accomplishment to do so. It makes it an accomplishment to do so. Uh, there are certain ingredients that, that must go into your, into your assembly, or, your, or it's a mathematical certainty that your assembly will be poor. So the number one ingredient is, is sufficient coverage. This has been well studied for, for decades. Uh, here's a plot of the Lander-Waterman statistics that, that relate your depth of coverage to your expected context size. And it's just a mathematical certainty that if you have low coverage, the, the genome won't be covered, the reads won't overlap sufficiently uh, far enough that you'll be able to detect overlaps such that your contents will be, sh will be small. The number uh, two factor in my mind is, is read length and also library composition. So what I'm trying to show here is, is so all, the way that all assemblers work is by taking reads and then uh, uh, computing how they overlap, either implicitly or explicitly. Uh, so what I'm trying to show here is, you know, here's a read, overlaps this read, then it overlaps some reads in the middle, and then there's this branch point. 
And what I'm trying to show here is if in the middle of your genome there's a repeat of, of a certain size such that the assembler just doesn't have enough information to know is it the green connected to the yellow or purple, vice versa. You know, there's, there's just an, a fundamental information barrier that's, that the assembler has to recognize or, or risk misassembly. Uh, infinite amount of coverage with this, sort of, with this sort of genome structure will just never will be able to assemble it correctly because there's just, there's just this gap here. However, if you can overlay this with longer reads or the right libraries or the right other type of information, then you can thread through these different repeats and recognize, aha, this green sequence must be connected to this yellow sequence, this blue sequence must be connected to this purple sequence. So that, but that requires a fundamentally different type of data to do so. And then the number three ingredient is, is high quality. If you have a, either a, a, a very low quality reads or very low quality library and you, and you try to look through these in the raw state, it just gets to be really, really computationally expensive or impossible to figure out well, how these different reads overlap just because all of the, the errors will, will distort uh, uh, how they should do so. What's interesting though is today there is no single instrument that excels in all three categories. So the Illumina instrument, for example, you can get really good uh, throughput, so that'll give you nice coverage, really high accuracy, that's great. Uh, so you can have an accurate reconstruction. But the reads are, are, are quite short, especially when we're talking about human or maize or, or pine trees or some of these other genomes that are enormous. You know, 100 base pairs out of a, 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 out of a 100 gigabase genome just isn't enough, this isn't, fundamentally isn't enough information to, to figure out how the reads ought to overlap. But if we can mirror this technology with another technology that offers long reads, and today by far the instrument that excels at this the best is the, is the PacBio RS, where you can get reads that are 10,000 bases or longer. If we can mirror these technologies together, that can become a really powerful recipe for assembling really complicated and, and, and large genomes. If only we can overcome this barrier here that these data have uh, considerable, uh, uh, considerably lower accuracy than, say, the Illumina. So what we've done is, we've, is oh, just to kind of give you a snapshot on, on to what these data look like, I, I think some of you have probably seen these before, but maybe some of you have not. So this, these are results from resequencing uh, just a standard yeast strain at Cold Spring Harbor. These data are about a year old now. So uh, the, the dynamics have changed somewhat in terms of the, all of the read lengths are getting better, all the throughputs getting better, the, the accuracy has gotten better a little bit, but, but those trends are, 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 are more or less the same. So the idea here is we're going we're gonna to resequence the 12 megabase uh, yeast genome. Uh, this is done on what's called smart cells instead of flow cells. Uh, and, and unlike, say, Illumina or, or even 444 to some extent, where the read lengths are, are more or less the same, the read lengths on this instrument come across on a, on a distribution. So the way to read this figure is that if, if you're considering every single read, so a minimum length of one, we have just shy of 40x coverage. If we're looking at 1,000 base pairs, then we have just shy of, uh, what is it? Uh, maybe 16 or 17x. If we go out to 2,000 base pairs, the coverage cuts cut as a, as a dramatically. If we were to do this experiment today, this curve would be shifted over. That's because the reads are, are tending to get longer with the new chemistries, the new way of loading them, and so forth. But they'll still come across through this distribution where you'll get uh, some very long reads, but then many of your reads will be, will be shorter. So that's those data. The really interesting thing from an informatics standpoint is the quality, right? So this is a true alignment of just one read picked totally at random, aligned to the reference genome. We thought we, re we had resequenced, you know, the same species or, the, you know, the exact same reference. So there shouldn't have been any variations. But when we do the alignment, we, we see a plot like this. First time I made this plot, I was, you know, very much scared away by this, right? This is, this is considerable uh, error. Uh, if you count up the bases that match exactly, it's around 84% accuracy, you know, with tons and tons of insertions, deletions, and, and mismatches relative to, say, Illumina. So th this is the first plot, but then, you know, you kind of scratch your head at it in, in a while, and if you just kind of squint at it, and, you know, forget about all the tick marks where they mismatch, if you just sort of squint at it, you know, there's, there's actually really good information there in the sense that these reads are long. You know, we have reads here, thousands of bases long. They don't, you know, they're not high, they're not high uh, uh, identity, but there's still really, very really useful information in there from an, from an assembly point of view, especially for, for threading through those repeats. So what we did was uh, we developed an, an error correction pipeline. You can think of it as like a, like a read polishing uh, technology, where the idea is we're going to start with one of these long reads that, you know, has 15% error rate or what have you. We're going to do a very careful read mapping operation then we're, where we're going to combine these long reads with, say, Illumina reads 
We're going to map these short reads onto these long reads. And then for every one of those long reads, we're going to run you know, a little mini assembly around it. And then the consensus of that mini assembly will become our now uh, read, uh, polished up long read. Um, so it's a way of, of, of doing uh, kind of the, it's a hybrid approach to doing error correction of these data. So the results of this are, are, are in my estimation, uh, uh, working quite well. So this is data looking at an E. coli genome that's available at PacBio, but we've seen the same trend occur now in uh, probably about a dozen different genomes or so. What we're going to start with, yeah, we're going to have our distribution in read length. The key thing over, over here is that there's just going to be this distribution in, in percent accuracy, if you will. And with these data, it was about 88% accurate of the reads that we could align. This is kind of the before picture. We run the error correction pipeline using, uh, in this case, 50x coverage of Illumina. This is the after picture. The key thing here is that whereas before the data were like 88% accurate, now we're, we're really approaching 100% accuracy. So if we, if we go back two slides you know, and look at this, this uh, uh, noisy alignment here, if we looked at the after picture of this, it would basically be a perfect alignment. I didn't bother to put it in because it would be so boring to see that, yes, indeed, the, the bases line up perfectly. So this is, a, this is a great way to informatically take uh, uh, noisy data, but really be able to pull out you know, all the useful information in terms of the read length. Uh, these data can be used for, for, for you know, any application where long reads would be helpful. Um, in particular, we're interested in de novo assembly. I'm not going to go through in any detail how it works, but we've retrofitted the Solera assembler that was developed you know, a decade ago in, in support of the human genome sequencing back at Solera. It already supported reads up to about 1,000 bases. We've retrofitted it to support now reads up to 32,000 bases. So, uh, and it, and it, it'll take a mix of, of these very long reads with, with some shorter reads and assemble them uh, into contigs and scaffolds. So we've applied this to a number of different organisms, you know, everything from tiny phages up to the, to, to date, the largest genome we've looked at has been the parrot genome. And when we compare it to kind of the standard uh, Illumina libraries for, say, Allpass or, or or SOAP de novo, what we see is that adding in even moderate coverage of these bio, error corrected packed bio data, suddenly all the statistics get better. So the, the key one that we've really been looking at has been uh, contig length and, and also uh, sort of gene accuracy, and the contigs get much bigger, and then our ability to find promoters in relation to genes that we're interested in goes up uh, quite significantly. Just as a note to myself, these error-corrected long reads are also great for transcriptome analysis. You can more or less get full-length uh, uh, transcripts after running the error correction pipeline. So that was vignette little, number one. The second vignette uh, may be a little bit sensitive for you, uh, describing some, for some of you, uh, describing some ongoing work at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, really tracking down the, the genetic component of autism spectrum disorder. So as I'm sure uh, uh, you've all been aware in the press, there's been a lot of sort of controversy and, and uncertainty about what is the relationship between environment, uh, family, genetics, uh, uh, and, and other different factors that, that really can lead to the, really lead to, to the disorder. In, 2000, in 2007, there was a nice study done at, at the Wiggler Lab at Cold Spring Harbor that was just, that was just looking at all sort of phenotypic data, all sort of family pedigrees, trying to answer this question, well, what is it about autism? Is it environment? Is it, is it genetics? What is it? And there were, some, there were some really interesting conclusions that were drawn from this. So the, as a population as a whole, the, the, the rate of autism is about 1 or 2 percent, um, 1 or 2 percent chance of, of, of giving birth to an autistic child. Uh, but certain families are at much higher risk. So in particular, identical twins have about a 90 percent concordance rate. So if one has autism, they both do. But non-identical twins only have about a 50% concordance rate. Now, that's, that's interesting because non-identical twins uh, you know, will, will more or less have very, very similar environment, have very, very similar uh, upbringing, which kind of factors out the environment. Um, but the fact that identical twins have such a high rate suggests that there is a very strong genetic component uh, to the disorder. So this led to what's been called a, a unified genetic theory of, of autism. That, that asserts there are, there, are, there are basically two mechanisms where you may uh, give birth to an autistic child. So the, 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 the one that leads to kind of common autism is there'll be in your family, there'll be a, a, a mutation that, that persists through the bloodline. 
But then also there's a, there's a you know, co as a common, as a relatively common uh, uh, mechanism. But then there's also a mechanism where there'll be sporadic mutations in your, in your genome. So whereas my genome is, is composed primarily of my parents' genome, it's been well known for, for, for a while now that there, are, there will be a small number of these so-called de novo mutations. Uh, so for a healthy person, this is for any person, it'll be on the order of a few hundred bases in your genome will be different from your parents' genome. So it was, it was theorized at this, it was hypothesized at this time that that was one of these contributing elements that would explain um, just, the, just the patterns of the disease that had been noticed. There's been work now for years that, that, have, that have tried to confirm or deny this hypothesis. The largest study to date that's been published was published last year. It was looking at de novo copy number mutations in families of, of kids with, with autism. This was done in the Simons uh, Simplex collection. So this has been families that have been uh, interviewed around the U.S. Uh, where, it's, where it's families where one kid has autism, none of the other siblings have, are autistic. And here what they're doing is, is using a, a CGH array to look for uh, large-scale de novo uh, copy number changes. So the, in, the, in the total uh, sample, they discovered 94 such mutations. Uh, but there was an interesting finding, and that, and that is that the, the relative rates of de novo mutations was much higher in autistic kids relative to their non-autistic siblings. So this, this really starts to suggest that this, th this unified theory of these sporadic mutations playing a role uh, really seems to be um, significant here. Uh, here's a map of where those copy number changes were across the human genome. For the most part, it was, it was sort of scattered. It wasn't, you know, wasn't one locus or, or even a few locus that were uh, observed. Uh, it was mostly you know, distributed throughout the genome. There was this one particular locus on uh, 16P11 that seemed to be recurrent. Uh, there was some you know, deep functional analysis of what were the genes there, what were the genes uh, throughout the whole genome. As kind of as you might expect, you know, a number of these genes were, were known to be related to other psychiatric conditions. This was in 2011. So over the last couple of years, we've been following up with this, with this array study with a much more detailed uh, exome sequencing project. And the idea is, is kind of of the same spirit, where we'll be doing a, a very detailed analysis of families with, with autism. Uh, but instead of getting sort of this coarse grain copy number signal, we're really going to be diving deep into the, you know, all the mutations from point mutations uh, up through larger events. The pipeline is, is relatively standard these days. We're, we're going to prepare the, the families as a, and capture them as a whole to sort of minimize the batch effects. But then it's a relatively standard. Uh, parts of this are relatively standard through demultiplexing, through doing the initial alignments with BWA, GATK for SNP and endo calling. We, we did develop some custom code for copy number analysis, microsatellite analysis. Kind of the really special box here is is because we're really interested in de novo mutations, we're really up against the noise, right? If there's recurrence, sequencing error of any sort of sort, you know, it'll appear as if it's a de novo mutation when it's, when it's really noise. So we really have to be certain that our, you know, the SNPs that we're seeing, the indels that we're seeing are really spot on. So we developed a new sort of informatics piece that we call microassembly that, that, that gives us a, a, another tool to be able to filter out the noise. I, 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 don't, uh, I assume that for those of you that have, say, used GATK to track down indels have experienced this problem where the calls you get are, are, can be a little bit funny at times. So this microassembly pipeline uses a hybrid approach of, of read mapping and de novo assembly to really, really carefully study these events. Uh, so the idea is, is we'll use the read mapping approach to localize which reads are associated with a given exon, do an on-the-fly assembly of that exon, this will let us tease out the two haplotypes, if there are any sort of heterozygous uh, uh, mutations along there. Uh, and then given those contigs now that reconstruct the exons, it's, it's much easier to align them back to the reference genome to identify a mutation. So here's an example from one of these kids, or one of these families, where uh, dad and mom exactly match the reference genome, this, the non-autistic sibling exactly match the reference genome. But here are the two haplotypes uh, revealing a de novo mutation in the autistic kid. The first time we looked at this locus, it was, you know, GATK had flagged it as something funny, uh, but it really got confused in, in this region about what was inserted, what was deleted, what were the SNPs. Uh, so we microassembled it, we ran it, and, which gave us this result. We then confirmed it with PCR and a bunch of other follow-up analysis, and this is, the, this is the true variation specific to this kid. So we look, so so far we've, we've studied 343 families. This is about 10 or 15% of the way of the total project, we're going to look at about 3,000. 
And we see, um, well, we see lots of mutations both in, in autistic kids and their non-autistic siblings. But what's really special is what we see is, is significant enrichment in what we call likely gene killers. So while the overall rate is more or less one to one, there's about a two-fold enrich enrichment in nonsense mutations, about a two-fold enrichment in frame shift in dose, four-fold enrichment in splice sites, uh, mutations that interrupt splice sites. So this, again, this really drives to uh, uh, de novo mutation as a, as a causal mechanism um, for the genetics of autism. We've, we started to do the functional analysis of this, and, and uh, we noticed that there's a very strong overlap with the genes that are involved here, with the genes that are known to be associated with fragile X, uh, mental, mental retardation. This is, this is somewhat not surprising in the sense that these genes are related to neuron and brain development. So it makes sense that there, if, if there are disruptions along there, uh, that it would also affect the kids in these ways. We also looked at the parents of, of all of these uh, across the population, and we don't see hardly any mutations in these sets of genes in the parents. So that strongly suggests that they're on strong purifying selection to keep any such changes out. And we hypoth hypothesize that, that these are really essential genes for development, and they're really particularly uh, 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 sensitive to doses changes. So that if one of these likely gene killers interrupts one of the, your two copies in your genome, uh, that'll just, that can have significant uh, implications for the, for the phenotype. Uh, the paper describing all this is just went on to review a few days ago. So with that, I would just like to circle back to the beginning and, and summarize um, where I kind of think is the state of the art in, in, in genomics, in particular in metagenomics. So the foundations of, of genomics or megagenomics will continue to be observation, experimentation, and, inter and interpretation. So if you think back to the 1800s of Mendel looking at pea plants, you know, he was making observations, he was doing crosses, doing experiments, and then interpreting all the observations that he was making. Really what's special today is, is that the, the technology has enabled us to do this over very large populations at extremely high resolution and for diverse applications. Complementary to the biotechnology is gonna be the, the rise of quantitative and computational technologies that, that need to support all of this research. This is gonna really hit at every single level. So even experimental design, where we're gonna be out in the field getting samples, at the time that the samples are collected, we need to be collecting all that metadata so we can go back and understand what we're looking at. So that's gonna be driven by technology. You know, observations, we're definitely going to need to, you know, store, analyze, compute over these massive data sets. That's computational. The integration will come through uh, looking at multiple samples, looking at multiple assays, you know, using the right machine learning techniques, the right uh, uh, models to be able to infer things that we can't quite see. And then even if we had infinite samples, infinite observations, infinite, you know, sort of capabilities for integration, the frontier will always be discovery. And this is always going to be driven through people, right? So if we can put all these tools, all these resources in front of someone, uh, it's really going to be up to people to be able to make those biological conclusions that are, 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 are going to change you know, medicine forever. So I'm, I'm uh, extremely optimistic about the biotechnology, extremely optimistic about the, about the compute technology. I'm also extremely optimistic about the people. Don't get me wrong, but ultimately we're going to be limited by the capacities of the human mind. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge quite a lot of people. Um, again, the segment that Adam presented on my behalf is uh, sponsored by uh, KBase and DOE. Uh, the assembly work has been sponsored by NHGRI, and then the uh, autism work has been sponsored by the Simons Foundation. With that, I'll thank you and take any questions. Questions for Michael? When you have um, autism in identical twins, is it the same mutation in each? Ah, so the collection we have is the Simon Simplex collection, where we've excluded those folks. That would be a, a great study. Presumably, it is the same mutation. Other questions? This one over here. Three weeks ago, uh, the Nature paper reported that um, the Oxford nanotechnology, uh, you know, marketing uh, their new sequencing machine, in which 
six billion human genome can sequence it in 15 minutes. <laughs> so I don't know the fact that you, ha you showed uh, in the picture of that machine on your uh, the slide right. indicate that you must have an inside information. <laughs> Is it true? Is, is it true they can sequence uh, six billion base pair in fifteen minutes? The only information I have was was the talk that they presented at AGBT, which was uh, light on details. There was a, there was this claim was presented. Uh, there was a one picture histogram of you know error rate, which said it was you know between five and ten percent. It's it's we'll see we'll see. I'm I'm gonna reserve judgment until I have the device you know on site. Um, but, but that uh, the technology doesn't require any uh, chemicals. It's just an all physical, uh, you know, procedure, right? So that how could you uh, read uh, the nanopore five million base pair in one second? <laughs> I think we learned one thing in the <laughs> sequencing world: that's that talk is cheap. <laughs> Um, a naive question about autism. Uh, I gather it's a spectrum of That's right. conditions. Is anything more known about the genomic basis for that spectrum? To date, they're, they're, you know, we've, we've been up against a, a biotechnology problem where we haven't been able to ask these questions in, in the detail that we'd like to. So this, the collection that we've been looking at is, is very special. Uh, they interviewed the families, and it's been um, selected for, for kids that are higher functioning. Uh, so we've been, we've been purposefully slicing off pieces of the, of the, of the spectrum um, just in hopes that that would enrich the signal. I, you know, I could speculate that there could be, because we think there's a dosage effect here, that if there are more gene killers that have been um, introduced, that, that could cause the, the spectrum, but I'm purely speculating. Well, let's uh, thank all the speakers for a really uh, exciting session this afternoon.